promises, and then we went into the promises in the Old Testament of our Redeemer. And I want to pick up back up there just to get our rhythm of what's going on. And um, as a, as as the idea here, just to give us get us back to speed. I wrote a note in my notebook, and I can't read it, so that's why I stuttered for a second. Ago. The new red dot. The new red dot. Does that mean I'm louder? <laughs> okay. All right. The, Psalm 19. We're just going to read a few verses that we did go through last week, just to, again to get us in a rhythm of what the idea of the Old Testament picture of Redeemer. Um, there's promises in the Old Testament. This is where we're picking up with point two under point sub point three or whatever. I did A, B, C. This is C. This is point two under C. Promises in the Old Testament to our Redeemer, of our Redeemer. Uh, Psalm 19, verse 14. Psalm 19, verse 14. It said, Let the words of my mouth and my meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my rock and my Redeemer. Once again, recognize when you see in the Old Testament when Lord is all caps, when Lord is capital L. Um, Mark and I remember last week he said that, that when we talked about, was it last week or last Sunday night? Not last, the Sunday night before that. When we talked about uh, the Shema, it says Yahweh in the Bible, but he says, I memorized it as Adonai. When you talk to a Jewish person, never say Jehovah, never say Yahweh. They've always learned it as Adonai. Or Adonai, whichever way you want to say it. Um, but the point is, it's still the same word. It's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. Psalm 72, 14. Psalm 72, verse 14. And all we're doing is, is going through verses that promise us a Redeemer. Verse four, Psalm 72, verse 14 says, He will rescue their life from oppression and violence. Their blood will be precious in their sight. In their sight. And again, I told you that the word rescue there is the word for redeemer. He will rescue. He will redeem their life from oppression. And again, the picture again in the Old Testament is that God will be Israel's redeemer. Psalm 77, verse 15. Psalm 77, verse 15. Thou hast by thy power redeemed thy people, the sons of Jacob and Joseph. And when, and whenever you see these, there are different titles for the people of Israel. In the Old Testament, one of them is known as the sons of Jacob. And here it's concluded sons of Jacob and Joseph. And when we go through some of the things in the Old Testament, I'll show you how that became a split and how I show you how that... And basically what it's saying is Joseph got the double blessing. So he was a sub-heir. That's all it's saying there. 735, Psalm 78, verse 5. And it says, And they remembered that God was their rock and most high God, their Redeemer. So again, it's constantly pointing in the Psalms that God, that there's a promise that the Lord will redeem them, purchase them out of slavery. And it's kind of funny and ironic that we, we brought up the idea that in Matthew, they, the Jewish people claimed, actually it was John, I think, they claimed that they will never have a master, that they're not in slavery. And what, what the Old Testament always points to is that they are in slavery. And I, I think it's a good uh, bouncing off a little bit of what Will said on Sunday is we have to recognize how to witness and, and evangelize different groups. And one of the things is when people say, oh, I'm not a sinner, I'm okay. No, everybody's in the sin market. And here's a good point here is that constantly Israel is looking Toward God as their Redeemer, the person that's able to buy them out of the sin market. Redemption, point three under C. Redemption describes salvation from the viewpoint of ransom paid on the cross for our salvation. Now, at the cross of Christ, a lot of things, and this is as good as my graphics will ever get. Okay. That is just like the old rugged cross. That's as rugged as we're going to get. Um, a lot of things happened. And there was the idea of sin was met at the cross. And sin had to be paid for. And when, when, when you were bought out of that sin market, you were redeemed. So that's why I'm using the cross as a, as a crossing point. Isn't that cool? Let's do a little bit of graphics so you can see. 
And when we, we accepted that, so there was a ransom paid for our salvation. Um, you can call these key words. There's many words that have to do with the cross, but redeemed is one of them. And by that we'll see, look at Mark, we've, we've looked at it before, I know this is a New Testament, but I'll just show you how it was accomplished, even though the Old Testament pointed to it. Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Mark 10, 45, and we'll go back in a second, I'll show you something else. But Mark 10, 45 says, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Um, so the idea here is the ransom was paid for Mark 10.45 but the picture of that from Isaiah one of my favorite this is real good if you ever meet somebody once again in evangelism that's Jewish hand them Isaiah 53 just hand them the Bible say hey read this look at verses 10 through 13 Isaiah 53 and this is well beyond the part where he says he bore, our, uh, bore for himself our griefs and all that stuff, and where he was crushed for our iniquities. But verse 10 says, But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. If he would re- render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. But as knowledge the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide booty with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. And yet he himself bore the sin of many and intercede for the transgressors. So it's pictured in Isaiah 53, what he would do, and it was a done deal. Well, it wasn't done when he said it in Mark, but he was telling you that's what he was going to do. Another good word is propitiation. Propitiation. This is where the the where God was satisfied. Where God was satisfied with the payment that was made. I know it's a big fancy word. All it means is satisfaction. That God was satisfied. In other words, what Christ did on the cross was it good enough? Therefore, and that's why a good thing to understand when you get the gospel, Christ, Christ's death was sufficient. Now, if I add anything to it, what am I saying about that death? If I say, well, you've got to be baptized also. There's a, there's, well, we're going to talk about cults this weekend, and one of the cults always says, Christ plus baptism. That is cultic. Because if you add baptism to that, what are you doing? You're saying, you're saying it was not sufficient. If you add church membership, what are you saying? Death was not sufficient. That's why I always say and continue to say, not me alone, but where we say faith alone in Christ alone. Should you be baptized? I don't have a problem with it. Should you be a church member? Don't have a problem with it. But it's not part of salvation at all and should never be emphasized as part of salvation. The third word that we're going to deal with tonight just quickly is justification. Justification is a judicial aspect, a legal aspect of your, of your, of your sins being adjudicated. In other words, you were, the sins were not removed and went nowhere. You weren't given a, a, a bill that says, well, you're okay, legally you're fine, we'll just expunge your record. No, the sins were placed on Christ and His righteousness. So at the cross there was an exchange made. Your sins were placed on Christ. So you could take your sins and cross them over here. Were placed on, on Christ. And Christ's righteousness... was placed on you. So you became plus R minus, minus S. If you want to do something that has to do with math, and Christ became plus S minus R plus R because He has His own righteousness in and of Himself because He's God still. <laughs> Can't say... 
So what happened is the cross was exchange made. You know that old adage where it says, this is sin and this represents me and God claimed and took your sin away and there you were out sin? No, that's not what happened. Because he didn't take this and I'd give you something. So it's not the whole picture. And if we do this like this, what happens to 1 John 1, 9? He took all my sins. I'm not going to sin anymore, see? So we have to understand, this is relational. We have to build a relationship first and then we have to deal with fellowship. So all this has to do with relationships. So. And if you notice that all these things have to do, these three things we dealt with, this is the, this is the cruddy one. This, I think, has had its day. Propitiation, justification, redemption, those are all pictured in the Old Testament that Christ would do, that the Messiah would do. And they still speak about it within the, old, within the Judaism today. Uh, point number four, the extent of Christ's payment on the cross. The extent of Christ's payment on the cross. Actually, this is sub-point under it. Well, anyway. Um, the extent of Christ's payment. Christ did this on the cross. How much did it cover? Now, there's two basic views. And I have fun with this. Wait, Will, you wrote a lot. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> That's good. Um, there's... There's limited atonement. And obviously there's unlimited atonement. Let's do that. Saves me writing. What this says, what limited atonement says, is Christ died only for the elect. And the elect, this word, this nice little word kind of thing, is those that are saved. In other words, when Christ died on the cross, he died for only people that would be saved. Unlimited atonement says Christ died for all. And believe me, this is a, 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 a huge theological um, discussion. This can also, we'll talk about it in a minute, can be uh, expressed two different ways. But as I look at this, this is an impossible situation. Because what this says is Christ's death was not sufficient. I, I totally don't ever... When somebody says I'm a five-point Calvinist, I need words we don't, uh, don't have to get too much into. A five-point Calvinist, uh, I got another acronym, but they believe in TULIP. Just remember that. And in the TULIP, this is the L we're talking about. Limited atonement. We go into another time. But be wary of that because what they're basically saying is we don't have to witness... We don't have to do anything because those will be saved. We'll be saved. God will just lead it. We'll just sit here and drink tequila and watch the sun come up or something. Um, I don't know what they actually do, but that's the idea behind that. But I'm going to tell you this. Christ died for all. Look with me at two verses. First Timothy 4.10. And I, I don't know. And I'm sure a few of you can attest to this, but I've talked to people until I'm blue in the face. Um... And I think Will's tape on your tape. I listened to Will's tape this week, and he said something about uh, I can't remember who it was. He gave that hour speech we went to, and he, the lady walked out afterwards and said something totally different. And he said, "I talked to so many people, and you say, how do they?" And here's one of these things. It's clear in Scripture that Christ died for all. How do people say only for the elect? How do they change? The, I don't. I just don't get it. First um, Timothy four ten says this. 4.10. My, if I said that, I stand corrected. 1 Timothy 4.10 says, for it, is, for, it is, for it is, for this we labor and strive, because we have fixed our hope on the living God, who is the Savior of all men, especially believers. Now, if it said, who is the Savior of believers, it would say that. What it's saying is that this payment of His death on the cross is for all. So when you stand before God... In, in heaven, and you're not saved, and he won't say, wow, you died for your, sin, your, your sins, you've got to pay for your sins. No, you're not going to stand before God ever in lieu of what your sins put you there. You're going to stand before him because of what you did with Jesus. Greatest statement ever said, well, what should I do with Jesus? Pilate, great statement when he said, well, what should I do with this man? Because it's everybody's statement. What do you do with Jesus? Because he's death was for all. That means when he died on the cross, 
everyone's sin was paid for. First John 2.2. 2, I think a few of you are familiar with this. And I, I don't know. I don't know what the Calvinists do with this. I'll be honest with you. Um, a long time ago, I learned something. I only read other people's stuff. I almost said junk. <laughs> other people's stuff when I'm trying to find out something specific. But I don't really read a whole lot of... Um, if you go to my library, I have very few Calvinistic or, or leaning uh, commentaries. And verse 2 says this. I don't know how... Is this clear to you or is it not? He himself is the propitiation. That means the satisfaction for our sins. And not ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Now, does that say Christ died for, for all? I, I don't know how... Clear, please tell me if I'm not reading this correctly. It's plain English. So how can I ever say Christ died for only the elect? And that, lim, that the atonement that He died for was limited. Uh, I, just, I just don't see that. Now, with a subnote with this, and what I'm doing all this stuff is to get you guys in, in, a, in a mindset to understand redemption. Because when we go back to Ruth, you can see a wonderful... I'll tell you something. I don't think we can get the scope of our Goel that we have in God's Son. What God's Son did for us. Um, redemption portrays the human race as... You won't believe what I just did. Picked up the bad one. <laughs> That's a good idea. Yeah. I think he killed Jane a few times. Um, we're slaves. And redemption pictures us in the slave market of sin. And there's no way we in and of ourselves can get out of that market. I, and again, I think it's important for us to get people to understand everyone is a sinner. You can't get anybody saved if they don't understand their sin. Because what, the first, person, first thing most people will say is, I'm okay. What they're basically saying is, I'm not tied to that market. And we've got to make sure they understand they are in the sin market. Because if they think they're okay, they'll never need a what? A Redeemer. Savior. Because they're not in the sin market. You may be a sinner. I see how bad you are, but I'm not. And we've got to get them to understand it. And redemption's a good portrait that the human race is in the sin market. Now, how do we how do we get them out? First Peter chapter one. Now in the slave market there's an exchange going on. You realize that any time you go to a marketplace, let's 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 put up here marketplace, because one of the words we use was agarad though. And that was the marketplace. Spelt it wrong. A G Agarazza. There we go. And that's where we get marketplace from. And in the marketplace, there's always an exchange going on. There's money going back and forth. And in our coinage, we use paper money. We use silver. We use gold. We use whatever we exchange to get goods. Now, it's kind of interesting. First Peter 1.18 says, Knowing that you were not redeemed with perishable things like gold, silver or gold, from a feudal way of life inherited from your forefathers. So this, this marketplace exchange has been going on for how long? Forever. Because we've got it because our fathers did it and their fathers did it. And this exchange is going on and they used perishable things to get out of the slave market. So let me ask you something. I want to get out of the slave market of sin. How much would it cost me? Okay? Let's say, let's put a number on it. Just for the sake of conversation, I put a million, I put a billion dollars. Okay? And you can get out of the slave market. How good would that be if it gets you out of the slave market and a billion dollars now is estimated at 15 cents because there's a crash? Where would that put you back? Wouldn't that put you right back in the slave market? Because it's not enough to get you out. I said a billion. But now the exchange says it's only worth 15 cents. Because why? It's perishable. It's perishable. What happens if I use paper money? And a couple of silverfish or something come in and eat the money up. It's perishable. And if you ever did a, a real interesting study to do one day, is find out the different exchanges 
different countries used for coinage and what it's worth today over the years. You know? Um, today our paper money isn't back like it used to be back. I don't even know if a dollar is really worth a dollar personally. Um, I'm not going to go into that. But what it says in verse 19 is a little different. It starts out with, but you were purchased out of the slave market by what? By, by precious blood as of a lamb, unblemished and spotless as of Christ. There was a sacrifice made for you that pulled you out of that slave market. What price do you put on that sacrifice? What is it worth if a man lay down his life for you? Can you put a price on that? Now, not only your life only, but Christ, when He died, He paid for the sins of the whole world. And the price to get you out of the marketplace was a sacrifice. Remember, when you see the statement, blood of Christ, there is nothing magical about His blood. This is a, uh, an idiom for sacrifice. And I even say, when you see that, put in that word that it was a sacrifice. Now, once you're bought out of the slave market, this is something I think we feel, uh, one of the great points you brought up, I must tell everybody, um, is the gospel isn't just what gets them saved. And I think we stopped some some point right when they get out of the circle. We say, "Oh, yay! We got a number. They got saved. Yeah!" And drop the ball. We got to tell them what what doesn't put them back in, because they got to understand this exit. The door is closed. You can't be put back in the slave market. Christ paid for you, took you out of the slave market, made the payment to keep you free. The only way you can go in any kind of slave market is if you become a bond slave to Christ. That's not the slave market now. That's not the marketplace. That's your willingness to be submissive and, and put under Christ. But you're free. And your freedom means you can't get back in. Because what did you do? And this is really good. What did you do to get out? So therefore, what can you do to get back in? And if Christ paid it all and you accept that, can he take it away? He can't. Um, one of the really good things, I don't know what you're doing with the First John, but look at some of the verbs in there, how it moves to a point, and the pronouns, to a point that's saying, it's not of me. I have nothing to do with this. And I think we have to remove ourselves from what we do to be saved. And this picture of redemption shows what Christ did for us, to us, and with us. Think about that. Because once, once you put yourself in the formula, you're going back to the original thing, is Christ's death sufficient? No, because there's nothing in you that's worth saving. Do you understand? That would say, I'm good enough to be saved. Now, understand when Christ died on the cross, some of the things that were, were done, Christ died. Let's, let's do this. You guys got that? There's two deaths. I just need to talk about this real quick. There's two deaths of Christ on the cross. There's his spiritual death and his physical death. Now, we so often look at the atrocity that was done to him physically and how he was beat and he died physically, but that wasn't important. Do you realize that? It was. And let me rephrase that. It was important, but it didn't count towards our salvation. This had zero to do with our salvation. Because when Adam and Eve sinned and said, you shall surely die, what happened at that moment? Did they die? That was a loaded question. <laughs> okay. Notice, how, notice the results of their death. Yes, they died. They died spiritually. But how, did we, how do we know they died? 
they became what? Very good. They took partook from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and what did they have all of a sudden? Knowledge of what they thought was right and wrong, because what the first two things they did. They, they, I, I heard three different things. They covered up what? Their stuff. Okay. Okay. They were naked. They covered themselves up. In their own fashion, they fashioned something they thought was good enough to cover their sin. I love that picture. But what else did they do? They not only covered themselves up, what did they do? They hid because God said, Adam, where are you? Okay? So they knew that they did something wrong because they would have been standing out there stark naked and saying, hey, God, we're fine. But they recognized they had sinned. Okay? But they didn't die except spiritual, they had spiritual death which separated them from God. Didn't it? Did God move? They did. Behind a bush. Or tree. I'll leave myself out of this. <laughs> we don't know where they hid, but God had to call out. Did God know where they were? Let's, you know, let's be honest. God knew where they were. God wanted them to recognize that they had moved away from Him. Okay, so, when, so the spiritual death of Christ on the cross was the penalty for the penalty for sin is what? And we always think what? Physical. Penalty for sin is death, spiritual death. Okay? When when Adam when Adam and Eve died spiritually, um, it was instantaneously. But then it goes on to say that Adam lived nine hundred and thirty years. What is that also showing you? That the result of spiritual sin leads to physical death, that at some point the body's going to die. But if I live 930 years, that's pretty good span of time. Okay? But we can look at this. This was the penalty. This was the consequence. Physical death was the consequence of sin. So when Christ died on the cross, He died from 12 to 3. He said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Because God can't look upon sin. He's separated. He's paying for sin on the cross, but he didn't die until he did he? At that moment, he was dying spiritually. Then later, he comes off the cross to die physically to conquer the consequence. So we no longer have the penalty or the consequence of sin. It's been paid for. You know, I, I, I so often when I talk to people, I want them to understand that in this lifetime, you will sin. You will be forgiven of that sin. Yes or no? Okay. But will, you, will this consequence be erased? Not always. Sometimes you have to live with your consequences of sin forever. You know, um, a friend of mine was playing with illegal fireworks when we were kids. And he lit that baby and says, Watch how long I can hold this. I didn't want to be around for that. He has missing two fingers from here. So it was, Cherry Bomb will take it off. Um, but he's missing part of his two fingers. Was he forgiven of the sin? But the fingers weren't replaced. You see what I'm trying to show you? The consequence of sin. Um, today we have many kids that have had children out of wedlock. The consequence of sin. The baby's not sin. Sinner. <laughs> In need of salvation. But that's the consequence. Now they have to deal with that, that situation. So, I mean, we've got lots of things going on with... with but we've got to learn to separate these two and understand that they were both paid for. And, and this was paid for three days later when Christ defeated sin. And in 1 Corinthians 15, great chapter on, on death, dying, and the victory of death. But it, it deals with both of these. Keep in mind it's talking about both of these. And we do have to separate them because when we always see and I haven't seen the movie, but I guess a lot of the emphasis on the passion of, for, of Christ has been focused on his physical uh, torture, his physical death. But I don't know how much, and again, I haven't seen it, how much is focused on, because this is the important one. This is for salvation. This is what saved us. This one is what shows us we've defeated and conquered the consequences of it now. That one day we will have a body like his because he resurrected three days later and we'll have one like his. So there's, there's a lot of things that have to do with that. Um, so going back, let's just try and catch up to speed with what we're talking about in the Goel before I give you the 
let's see how many more points I have. Uh, just a couple more on this, and then we're going to get into the results. The Goel. Again, it's oh man, it's, it's just fascinating to you, all the all, all the historical aspects of this and how the idea of Goel from the Old Testament impact of it in Deuteronomy, Leviticus, till the growth of it when Christ came, how it's like a um, a living letter because it took on different shapes and different forms and different purposes. But it, by the time Christ came, it had to have a hypostatic union. In other words, our Goel had to be human. Remember we talked about that? Had to be a man. Had to be able to redeem us from the marketplace, but not be in the marketplace. So he had to be a man. He had to be sinless. Okay, so I put him in the, as a man. So this is where we're 100% man. And the incarnation, we can put the incarnation here also, because that genetically tied him to the human race. And let's just take this for a second and run with this for a second. Tell me the second Samuel. <clears throat> excuse me, second Samuel. Second Samuel, chapter seven. And and think of how many times Jesus calls himself this phrase. Remember that, that phrase he calls himself, Son of Man? He says, I am the Son of Man. What is he saying about himself? I am man. I love the, uh, as you go through, especially the Gospels, focus on some things that said, isn't he the guy from Galilee? Doesn't he have this person? Doesn't he? And all the tie-ins to his humanness. Because there's nobody that could say, when Jesus lived, oh, he wasn't a human. He was superhuman. Just like, uh, it's looked at him just like you and me kind of deal. Um, 2 Samuel verse eight, seven, ver- chapter 7, verse 8. Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, that you should be ruler over my people Israel. And I have been with you for whatever uh, you whatever you have gone, wherever you have gone, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name like the names of the great men who are on earth. I will also appoint a place for my people Israel and will plant them, that they will live in their own place and not be disturbed again, nor will the wicked afflict them any any more as formerly, even from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. The Lord also declares you that the Lord will make a house for you. When your days are complete and lie down with your fathers, I will raise up a descendant after you who will, be, who will come forth from you and I will establish his kingdom. He will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, we're just going to stop there for sake. It goes all the way through 16. This is known as the Samuel 7 is known as the Davidic covenant. And the Davidic covenant is a sub-covenant of the Abrahamic covenant. And the idea behind it is that there would be a name that would from the son of David that would rule on that throne forever. And as you go through the age, of David, actually Ruth is in that lineage, <laughs> David, then so way down after that is Jesus Christ. So he was human. He was also, in his humanness, he was son of man, we'll put in here slash son of David, so we just talk of David. He was also a high priest. And in his high priest, and that's Hebrews chapter uh, 9, chapter 10, talks about his priesthood. In his high priesthood, he represents man to God. And and he's also... It's kind of interesting when he was talking... Luke chapter 1, I think it is, the, the angel's talking to Mary and saying he will save his people from their sins. I don't know if it's Luke or Matthew, but I'm pretty sure it's Luke. Will he save his people from their sins? What does that word Savior really mean? You ever think about that? What does that word Savior really mean? When you say, oh, you're my Savior to anybody, what is, that, what is that insinuating? Okay, but what happened? That you're in danger, okay. What What did you say? Oh, 
Okay. That's good. That's an aspect I didn't think about. That's true. Um, but what I'm more looking at is the substitution value. When somebody saves you, they put their place, their, themselves in your place. I can only think of all those middle of the things where somebody takes an arrow for another guy, jumps in front, and saves them by substituting himself for that person. And the idea behind Savior, when Mary was told that Jesus would save his people, they knew that it was substitute for him. That he would not only substitute, but he would be judged. That there would be a judging involved. But as God... See, John chapter 1 talks about Jesus in the beginning. Turn here for a second. I want to show you something that's really neat that will help you guys doing Bible study. John chapter 1. What, what, what did you say? John chapter 1. Um, how many people have ever heard that this word in Greek equals Jesus Christ? Whenever you see logos or, or, or you'll see the word it means Jesus Christ. And I'll tell you this, that's wrong. It's right, but it's wrong. Because it says, In the beginning was the Word. Verse 1, John 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now I'm going to show you a really neat trick. That word there is for Word is Logos. Or Logos, whichever way you want to say it. Now, substitute Jesus Christ for the Word. It says, In the beginning was Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ was with God, and Jesus Christ was God. Is there a problem with that? Absolutely not. So you can't do that there. But don't do it everywhere, because later in some, there's a couple of places, I think, in First John and Peter, it says the word of life. And you can't say Jesus Christ of life. It doesn't make any sense. So if it makes sense reading it normally, you can do that. You understand? So it's helpful to see that. But if you see that, the reason I read that that way was because in John 1.1 1, 1, it says that Jesus Christ was God. But as God, He can't be a Savior. Because a Savior in, in, insinuates that He has to die for our sins. And God can't, God can't die. God is eternal. God can't die. Like, here's God, let's put a bullet and kill Him. How do you do that? God's where? Everywhere. So what am I going to do? Shoot, shoot. <laughs> you understand the idea? You can't. How do you put God to death? God is omnipresent. We can't put him in one place, localize him to put him to death. So he's eternal. Now he's all powerful. Will a bullet kill him? An A bomb? Any a plutonium, whatever, a platinum <laughs> record <laughs> deal. Um, there's no way to kill somebody that's all powerful. But as man, he became local, he became limited in the human form, and he could be put to death. He could die when he wanted to. Because how many times do you see, especially in the Gospel of John, we read about it, he went out from the midst of them because it was not his time. They picked up stones to stone him. And where did he go? As far as being able to die being able to put to death. In other words, if he didn't want to die, he wasn't going to die. How, what did he do when he died? When he physically died, what did he do? He gave it up. So nobody actually killed him. But he is limited because he didn't always walk through doors. He did walk places. He, you know, he did... But that's... Yeah. In other words, but he limited. Yeah, so... <laughs> yeah. I don't want to say it that way, but yeah. He limited himself. Um, yeah, I know. It's, it's, it's lack. But in his humanness, he's human. How's that? In his humanness, he was human. In his deity, he's deity. Now, since he's the only one that did this, how do you explain it again? You can't. Because he's the only one. He's unique. That's why he says he's uniquely born of God. Because he's the only one. You know, um, when I was a kid, when Nolan Ryan threw a 105 mile hour fastball, I said, that's incredible. Nobody can do that again. Oh, yeah. Rob Nen did it. You know, there's a few other guys that have done, got it up there. So it can't be duplicated. But when you say Jesus Christ, it can't be duplicated. It ain't going to happen again. So there's a lot of theological tug of war going on about... But it's real easy to know this. In his humanness, he was human. So he could be a savior or high priest. He was the son of man. 
and his deity was God. He couldn't die, so he died in his humanity. Therefore, his deity never died. And don't make me explain that. Again. <laughs> the uh, Goel also emphasizes the doctrine of, of a mediator. It emphasizes the hypostatic union. It also emphasizes meteor, mediator. Now, those of you that don't understand a mediator, it's a go-between between two parties. Boy, you know, I was thinking about that when we were on vacation, Lizzie and I. I got to call this something, like the Biscayne Wave or something. Because there's a couple of times, I got about 80 of you doing this. It's kind of like, I'm going to let you keep doing it. <laughs> I can see myself as I slowly lose my mind as I get older. You all waving at me and I'm sitting there waiting for the bus <laughs> or something. Anyway, um, mediator is a go-between. So we could put it like this, man, God. How do we get there? We need a mediator. First Timothy chapter 2. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. I don't think it said any better than this. Verses 5 and 6. 1 Timothy 2, 5 and 6. It says, For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man Jesus Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, the testimony born at a proper time. So it's kind of interesting. It ties the mediatorship with his, re his ability to redeem. So he went this way, and it went that way. <laughs> kind, of, kind of idea. It bridged the gap both ways. It's kind of interesting because when Romans talks about we were, had an enmity between us and God. Do you ever notice the difference? We weren't enemies. We were an enmity. What's the difference? Here's the difference. I'm going to pick on Kevin. Kevin and I are enemies. That means he wants to wage war with who? With me. And I want to win the war against him. You understand? There's a there's mutualness. We don't know what started it, but sometime when the, our clans got together, there we became enemies. Enmity means Kevin loves me, but I hate his thinking God, so I'm going to do anything to wage war with him, and, but he'll do everything he can to what? To keep the peace and to love me. That's what God did that for us. We were at enmity. What happened? We basically went this way when God was doing what? Had his arms wide open to love us. So it's kind of interesting, that little play on words that sometimes people don't get. And people will say, we're en enemies with God. We are not enemies of God. We are an enmity. We moved away. Adam and Eve moved away from God. God was in, they were in total fellowship. They were in paradise. They partook of the fruit. And they hid. Who went looking? God. And please take that loosely. He didn't say, oh, where are you? I know where you were at. I counted to ten. I'm coming to find you. That wasn't the idea behind it. God wanted them to recognize where they're at. Now, in the last seven minutes, I want to get done with redemption, so next week we can start starting with chapter 3 of Ruth. I'll tell you something. There's some stuff in Ruth. If you don't... Oh, we'll do, never mind. I've been reading so much on the Goel. It's fascinating. Fascinating stuff. Um, let's see. About eight results of our redemption. The moment we're redeemed, these are the things that happen. First of all, we were delivered from the curse of the law. I? Who said slow down? My wife. We were delivered <laughs> from the curse of the law. Galatians 3.13. I want to have this a little interactive. Somebody turn to Galatians 3.13 and read that to me. Galatians 3.13. That Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who remains on the tree. And while you're there, Galatians four, four through six.
couldn't deal with the law. You couldn't live by its standards. And the law was never meant to save anybody anyway. I would I challenge people. Go from cover to cover. Find me a verse that says the Ten Commandments or any part of the Ten Commandments will save you. It's a challenge. It's never meant for that. It's, meant, it's only meant to show you how bad off you are. <laughs> or how awful you will get. So, uh, secondly, total forgiveness of sins. A total forgiveness of sins. Someone read Ephesians 1 7. Ephesians 1 7. Hebrews 9 15. Someone else get that. It's like sword drill. I like this. Just don't turn real fast in new Bibles. 9.15 Go ahead. Good. Thirdly, he's the basis for justification. Basis for justification. Redemption is the basis. Romans 3.24. This is real easy. If somebody finds it, reads it. Go ahead. Whoever's got it. You do one of those old things in the sword drill. Stand up. Start reading. Remember those? Fourthly, the basis for sanctification. Sanctification. Good. Ephesians five twenty five through twenty seven. Should make Scott and Natalie read that. Ephesians Huh? On tape? I'll get them on tape. Ephesians five, twenty five through twenty seven. Next is basis for eternal inheritance. And we already read the verse, so we're not going to go back and read it. We'll just jot it down. Hebrews 9.15. It's next. It's the basis. I'm running out of room. Give you all. You all got that? So I can turn the page and read it, write notes. I'll, I'll read the next one and I'll write it in a second. It's the basis for victory of Christ in the angelic conflict. Basis for victory of Christ in the angelic conflict. Or how about this? Basis for victory. Colossians. Somebody want to get this? Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Colossians 2, 14 and 15. Okay. Nextly, it's the um, well. We already covered that one. Um, in redemption. I'm running. I got to put this. Redemption. Redemption recognizes that payment has been made in 
four. And now we know this. You know, I, I, I'm going to tell you something. This is one of those statements we really don't understand. Okay, let me explain to you something like this. When you have children, you'll understand this. Those of you that don't, and those of you that do, don't have old enough children yet that I can see. You ask them, are you done cleaning the dishes? And they'll say, yes, I am finished. And you go in there, and they're not finished. So you never understand that when finished means done, means completed, that means nobody else has to do anything. Finished means kaput, done, finale. I can't think of any other word that says nobody has to go up and mop up after you. When Jesus says, it is finished, it can't be added to it. It's a closed-end mathematical formula. It's done. So when Jesus says, well, if it's finished, but I need to do this. No, 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 listen to me. Jesus says, it is finished. And he uses the perfect tense. That means it is finished, finale, done at that point in time, but it has resu- re- abiding results. That means when Christ died on the cross, you couldn't add anything to it, but the results of it would carry on when? Thank you. That means I could be saved. You understand? That means we couldn't add to it. We can't say, well, it's not finished enough. Or we can get finisher or, or whatever form of verb you want to change it to or he's finishing it. No, it's done. And the results for today, for tomorrow, for on. You understand that? And when you say, and I, I don't know if I can be any clearer to this, and I know we're going to go into the cult thing this weekend, but remember this, it's real easy. The best way to tell a cult is they add anything to salvation. And I call that a cult. If you look, you look at your list of cults, it won't always have, you know, you go to your Moonies, JWs, and all that stuff, and people say, oh, those are cults. Well, it's certainly they're blatantly obvious, but you know how many cults work on Sunday morning? In the name of a church? Because... They figure, it ain't done, we got to do something. And those fervent calls and cries for people to repent and to get down in sorrow over their sins, what they're basically doing is you have to do something to get right with God before God saves you. Think about that. And I think that's just as bad as, as some of the... Actually, probably pretty much worse. Last, last one. Last point. I don't know what number it was, so I do, I do that. That's that's a good number. That's it. This is dash number dash. Okay. It's the basis for redemption of the body in resurrection. Ephesians 1, 15, 16, 4, 30, and Romans, somebody pick a verse, 8, 23. You got, you got three, three sets of verses. Ephesians 1, 15 and 16, Ephesians 4, 30. Now watch everybody go to... That's 16 too? No. 14. Try 14. That doesn't sound right. 114. Yes. Fourteen. That's good. Okay, fourteen. Now Ephesians four thirty. Hey, listen, I can I can get this on the run. Romans 8.23. You know, um, I'm going to tell you this in closing. 
this is only one aspect that we've covered how many weeks? Three weeks on redemption? I don't know. This is only one aspect of Christ's ability that He did on the cross. One aspect of what He did in saving us. One aspect. Redemption. Imagine if we went through propitiation, sanctification. I'm just telling you people, if you don't realize what you've got when you've been saved, what you have when you've been saved, let's go back to better English, sir. I just can't, I can't get anybody else. You know, one of the things I have on my desk is I can't, I can't, I want to convince everybody, but I say, it's not me, it's the Lord, but me and people, it's so obvious. And I just, in the little picture we're drawing in Ruth, of who Boaz was as the Goel. Jesus fulfilled to the end and bought us out of the market. And for us to do anything to put ourselves back in it, I think the, the number two cult is legalism. But we'll get into that Sunday. Let's pray. Father God, we thank You for this time and, and we're just appreciative of what Your Son did as far as redeeming us. Paying a magnificent price too steep for us to ever imagine too steep for us to come up with and the incredibleness that we could not ever pay for our own sins because we are in the slave market and a slave cannot buy himself out of the market. But your son came in perfect humanity, fulfilled the law, and in that he paid for us on the cross, substituting himself on that cross for us. And in this we give thanks in your name. Amen.